Well, first of all, I want to say thanks, and thanks to Arnie for inviting me up here to, uh, to speak to you. And I was, I was tempted to say no, because he, he, it wasn't going to be a baseball speech. And uh, a lot of times uh, the talks that I give are, you know, hitting, fielding, stuff that I'm pretty comfortable with, or their state of the program addresses. Uh, this is the first time that anyone has asked me to uh, tell the story of my life. Um, that was what Arnie asked me to tell you, and in hopes that um, you know, maybe someone could take something from that. And, um, you know, I guess that was a little tough. I almost said no, because I don't like, number one, to talk about myself. And number two, I didn't want to come across as boastful. And, um, you know, my path was a little bit different. And there's actually, you know, some embarrassment at times with it. But um, if, it, if I told Arne if he felt like it would help and somebody might learn something from, from my path, then I would be glad to do it. Um, I want to say, Thanks to the baseball guys for coming. I appreciate that. And I know you had a long day. And my old partner, Dank, who was with me for 10 years as my right-hand man and um, was a big part of building an, an un unbelievable program and an unbelievable run uh, when we were here. And then uh, President Duffy for being here. I really appreciate that. And thanks for your time and, and coming down and having supper with me. That means a lot to me. And then, um, you know, I got Ken here and Louise, and I'll talk about them uh, a little bit more in my speech. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, uh, this is a special place to me. I, um, it's not just a place I went to school. This was home for 16 years uh, to me. And, um, you know, I'm a lot of things, but first and foremost, I, I am a peacock and it will always be a peacock. And this place uh, shaped who I am and made me who I am. And there were a lot of people that, that really helped me along the way. Um, and I'll go back to uh, what Arnie asked me to talk about. And I guess the message in my talk and telling you about my life is not just to tell my story, but hopefully um, that you can gain something from it in the fact that you know discipline, hard work, sacrifice, toughness, self-leadership, which I think is really important that a lot of people like to rely on. Uh, put the burden on someone else to to make you good. Um, you got to be, you got to lead yourself, and you got to find a way to get it done. And then also the biggest thing I can tell you is that you got to find a passion. And and I knew my passion early on, which is what saved me. I mean, I knew it was athletics. Um, at 12 years old, I would tell people that I was going to play three sports in college, and they'd all laugh at me, and say, Yeah, right, whatever. And um, but I knew I would. I mean, I absolutely loved to play. I loved to play. I knew if I wasn't playing for a living that I would be around the game, I'd be coaching, I'd be doing something. And so nothing was ever going to stop me from doing that. So I see so many people that kind of flounder around and most of the time it's because they really don't know what direction to go and they don't know where their passion is. They haven't found it yet, whatever. So that would be the biggest message I have. Find something that you absolutely love and then give everything you have um, to it. And then the last thing is to never quit learning. And that's... Um, why I'm where I'm at, because um, I was just a dumb kid when I got the job here, and um, I tried to be the best learner that I could possibly be. If I was going to ask our team to get better every year, then I was going to improve as well. And I would go to clinics, and I'd go to camps, and I'd buy tapes, and I'd buy books, and Kent and I'd swap books, and we found ways to get better, and I still do it to this day. I mean, I still go to two or three camps a year, and now I'm to a point where people ask me to speak all the time across the country at hitting and infield camps or coaches clinics or whatever it might be. And I remember um, the first time that Dank and I were at the national convention and Dank looked at me and he goes, can you ever see yourself up there someday? And I'm like, no way, there's no way I'd be up there. I haven't been to that one yet, but I've been to some pretty big ones. And I, I always think back to Mark and I talking about that, the first one we went to. But you have to be a lifelong learner. And, and as soon as you think you've got it all figured out, that's when you're done. You just have to keep learning and keep learning. The, the longer I do this, I'm still reinventing ways to hit and reinventing ways to field after 31 years as a head coach. So I'll leave you with this before I start the story. And I tell our team this all the time, that, that there's, three, there's three simple truths. Life will be difficult. You will not be rewarded for everything that you do and that you cannot be great unless you go through adversity and finish what you started. And, and, it's, and, and they're all true. And a lot of people expect to get something for what they give, and you don't always get results. You don't always get it. You know, you're going to get it in the long run, but you don't get it right now. It's not always instant gratification. Pretty much every summer uh, in high school, I would work out at the high school and help the janitors, help the custodians. It was a job I could do during the day, and then I could play baseball in the afternoon. 
Well, I was um, doing the job I'd done for the last three years, and I was trying to figure out what to do for college, and some bigger schools were talking to me and some other places, and my football coach, his name was Bob Gerard. Bob came in um, to work one day, and he said, hey, Rick, he goes, I, I want to take you on a trip. I want you to go to Fayette. And I said, what's in Fayette? And he said, Upper Iowa University is in Fayette, and my old college coach, Don Butterball, is the football coach there. And he goes, I just think that with your situation, you might have a fighting chance to make it there because it's a small enough town that the people might take care of you. And, there, and I know Don would help, um, you know, help Don try to find a job, and, and you just might have a chance to make it. And I said, okay, no problem. So, you know, out of the goodness of his heart, he loaded me up a couple days later and drove me up here and um, sat down and talked with Coach Butterball, and I really liked him, and I was a receiver, and he threw the ball a lot. He was kind of ahead of his game. He ran a one-back set, and threw it all over the field and um, so that sounded good to me and then they introduced me to coach pro and I sat in his office and he said that I could play baseball and at the time I wasn't really planning on playing basketball but he said no problem on the baseball end and um, that he'd help out and so made my made my decision and ended up uh, coming to Upper Iowa well I show up to two days I show up to two days and um, one of the first things I have to tell coach Butterball is that um, I got to leave on Saturday, or I got to leave Friday after practice because I'm getting married Saturday morning and then I'm playing in the Legion State Tournament that weekend. And he looked at me and I could tell by the look in his eye he didn't think I'd be back. And uh, so after Friday's practice, I jumped in the car and I was heading to get married. And um, I stopped, no lie, I stopped in Dunkerton to get gas and the car started on fire. And, <laughs> and, and back then there's no cell phones, so I'm trying to call on a, on a, on a on a pay phone and I'm trying to find somebody that'll come get me. I end up getting there like at four in the morning. I think they thought I was running from the from the wedding. Um, showed up at the Justice of the Peace and then um, got married at 9 a.m. and then I uh, played in the Legion State Tournament at one and uh, was back up for a football meeting Sunday night <laughs> at eight o'clock. And I love music and so a lot of people will say to me, hey, what was your first dance at your wedding dance? I say the Star Spangled Banner was. <laughs> But anyway, when, when I married, when I married, when, when I got married, um, the decision that was made was um, I was going to play. I was going to play sports. I was going to go to school. Are you okay with working? And then when I graduate, then I'll go, and you can. I'll go to work, and then you can go to school. And that was the plan we had, and that's what we executed. So um, about two weeks later, after two days, my wife came up. We moved into married student housing on Jones Street. And I showed up, I rolled into uh, Fayette with a, uh, a mattress, a baby bed, and a, a radio, and that was it. And that was all I had to my name. And then Coach Butterball followed through. He got my wife a, a job at Land's Inn in West Union, which made things a lot better. And then um, that's, when, that's when my focus changed from you know, sports only to number one, first and foremost, I gotta get a degree and I gotta get out of here in four years. And um, I found out that I was poorly equipped academically uh, to make it. And uh, I was way behind the curve, especially in communication and English. And I stuttered some as a kid, so I avoided public speaking at all costs. And that's when uh, some people came to my aid. And that's when Coach Prohaska kind of took me under his wing and he taught me how to be organized and he made me go do the right things class-wise and he showed me where I could get help. And Coach Pro had a big role in helping me get going with my with my studies. And then um, Dr. McReynolds, um, who I, they tell me is still still teaching. And so Doug Doug was really big uh, for me as far as figuring out uh, that I needed to get a lot better if I was going to do what I wanted to do with the English language and with with public speaking. And I would tell everybody in the room that I would take every speech class that you possibly can and I would learn as much as you can about communication because if you can communicate in this world, you can do anything. And if you can't, you'll fall behind. Even if you're smart, even if you're qualified, the guy who can communicate will get the job. So I can't tell you enough. Uh, if I could go back in time, that's what I would do. I would pay way more attention uh, to the English and to the speech. In high school, I'd be much more prepared when I came to college and I would have focused on it uh, a lot more. I figured it out, but I figured it out late, and, and then knowing what I have to do for a living now, if, I, if I'd have known that, I would have, taken, I would have paid extra money to go <laughs> and take, I would have taken loans because they didn't have much money, but I would have done whatever it had to, I had to do to, um, to be a better speaker. Um, and then also, I want to 
say that there was a guy here named Walt Griffin. Walt Griffin is now the president of Limestone College in, um, in South Carolina, and, and he took me under his wing as well, and I was a history minor. And uh, Walt was an awesome teacher. So he was so impressive. He would teach a Tuesday, Thursday session with his history class, and he would walk into the classroom, and he would cross, he'd sit on the desk, and he'd cross his legs, and he would talk for an hour and a half. And it was in detail, and it was entertaining, and he'd put his own spin on it. And you would be like this from taking notes, but you learned a lot from Walt. And, and Walt was also a tennis coach, and so he had a little bit of athletic background. And uh, he would wear me out if we were ever close to being late. He'd always say, where are you coming from? Dorman Gym, most unscholarly place on campus. And uh, <laughs> he would always wear me out. But he, um, he, was, he was big in my development um, as a student. And um, then uh, when I was a junior, uh, I don't know if it's still the same, but you could get your coaching endorsement. And so I, would, I, I was hired at North Fayette as assistant baseball coach when I was a junior in college. Um, Pat Bowman was the coach. He's an All-American. I think he's a Hall of Fame member as well. Uh, but, but Pat was a great peacock and a great hitter. And uh, Pat took me under his wing and got me involved in coaching. And I helped Pat for two years, my junior and senior year, which got me started. And then I was hurt pretty bad my junior year in football and um, wasn't able to play my senior year. So Ron Weimer was the coach at Turkey Valley. And Ron Weimer is another guy from Eldon who escaped. And Ron called me up and he said, uh, hey, Rick, he goes, if you're not playing football, why don't you come over here and do your student teaching and coach receivers and DBs? and I'll make sure you get an A in your student teaching. So I dro drove the 40 minutes to, to Turkey Valley to make sure, make sure I got it done. And then working for Ron was amazing because he's an unbelievable coach. I mean, he's, a, he's an outstanding motivator and he's, he's a great coach. So working for Ron really got my juices going and I really knew what I wanted to do for a living uh, if I couldn't keep playing baseball. And so long story short, I made it through. You know, graduated in four years over a three point and um, you know, Donna worked the whole time to make that make that happen. Uh, Tara grew up here on campus. Uh, I remember, car my, when, when you're poor, your cars are always bad. So I, my car was always broke down. I remember one time, my my wheel broke right up by Dorman Gym, broke completely off. And so I remember lugging her um, across campus in a foot of snow all the time, taking her to preschool. Uh, but we made it, and and we grad I graduated, got through, and uh, bad thing though, no pro ball. Um, you know, I, I, there was no Pro Bowl, and that's what I wanted. I went to every tryout I could, played about as well as I could, didn't happen. So at that point in time in my life, it was pretty crushing because that's what I had always thought I could do, wanted to do, and realized I had to move on. Uh, I was going to be a teacher, and back then computers were just kind of coming in, and I had sent out 100 resumes before I'd got any response from anybody, and sent out 100 resumes back in those days was not much fun because uh, it was a lot of manual stuff. and. Uh, Finally, the phone rings, and it's a guy in Bakersfield, Missouri, which is real, four miles from the Arkansas border between West Plains and Mountain Home, if that means anything to you. But it's way down in hillbilly heaven, and it was actually Ozark County. And uh, so I say, what the heck? I'm going to go down for this interview. My uncle, Ern, drove me down, and we've pulled into town, and we saw a sign that said, Firewood for Sale, W-U-D. So that's how far down in the sticks we were. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm all fired up, and I got a suit on, and, and uh, I get to the school, and it's this little run, this, this little rundown building, and uh, there, there are like eight people standing in line to be interviewed. <laughs> so so I, get in the, I get into the room finally. I stood out there for a few hours, and I get in there, and the school board all have overalls on, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to be as bold as I can be, and if I get this job, great. If I don't, who cares? And it went really well, and I remember asking about the PE curriculum, and the guy looked, they all looked at each other, and they said, well, play basketball. You're going to be the basketball coach, aren't you? And that was pretty much the story. <laughs> so I ended up uh, getting offered that job. I was down there, made some great friends, friends for life. Whenever we play at Missouri State, there's still a bunch of people from Bakersfield that come over. Um, but but it's, what happened, it's what happened after that year that, that really changed my life. I mean, for, it was a good thing. Because for the first time in my life, we were making some money. I think my salary was 22000 a year. Uh, Donna was making close to 20000 a year. So, you know, $40,000, $42,000 for a guy that had never had anything. That was a, that was a pretty big deal. And um, I had talked to Coach Prohaska. He was a basketball and baseball coach at the time. 
about working his camp that summer. So, it was in June, early June, and I called Coach Pro. And this was what I call the most important phone call of my life. And I got the wrong number. And I got the athletic director and head wrestling coach, Mike McCready. And I was, Mike was, and I were just talking, you know, obviously knew each other from when I was here. And, and um, you know, Mike and I always got along good. And, and Mike said, hey, Rick, he goes, um, glad you're on the phone. He said that uh, Coach Pro is thinking about not being the baseball coach anymore and just focusing on, on basketball. He said, if we can find the right guy, he would, um, he would give it up. So we're going to be taking some applications. I said, well, that'd be great. I would love to do that. He goes, well, here's the other side of it. He goes, you have to be the residence hall director. And Cabby and Louise are going to have a big say on who gets this job. And I thought, well, I don't know anything about residence halls. Um, but I do know that I get along good with Cabby and Louise. So I felt like I had a shot. And uh, so I get the interview. And um, long story short, you know, they hired me. And um, it wasn't because I was any good. I was the, I was, when I was hired, I was, the tw I was the youngest head coach in the country. I was 23 years old when they hired me and turned 24 that September. But uh, the reason they hired me is because nobody else applied for it, I don't think. I don't know, maybe four people. <laughs> because um, the program was in, 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 in rough shape at the time. And um, so with that being said, you know, um, my return to Fayette, and I want to give you a little bit of a, a history lesson um, before I get too far into this. You know, the Fayette in Upper Iowa that I went to was quite a lot different from the Fayette and Upper Iowa that, that you see today and what you have the privilege of enjoying. Um, it was a rough time in the history of, of Upper Iowa. Um, it was really close to the doors closing. In fact, I remember, I remember sitting with three teammates in 19, I believe it was 1986, uh, when Jim Roshlow was hired as our president. Um, and we were talking about would our degrees be worth anything if the doors closed and there wasn't a college? Would they be null and void? Just that was the topic of conversation and it was scary. Um, you know, we were down, I don't know what the official count was, but I'm gonna tell you there wasn't 100 people in the dorms. And um, you know, there probably wasn't 200 people going to college here, period. Uh, my junior year in football, we finished the year with 26 players. And um, fortunately, I wasn't one of them because I, I got destroyed about halfway through. But it was actually scary to play. It really was. For the first time in my life, I was scared to play football because, I mean, the shots you took and just how weak we were and how far things had digressed. And what happens is in, 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 in a small school like this, or, or, or really any school, if the chief executive officer doesn't know what he's doing or has a different agenda or doesn't like sports in a small school like this, that's what happens. And the rumor was, and I don't know if it's true or not, but the rumor was that through the 70s, through the 80s, uh, the president wanted to turn this into a business college. He didn't like sports. He didn't, he didn't have anything to do with them. And to see what the coaches back then had to go through, you know, um, it would make you sick. I mean, I remember Coach Pro, he didn't, he, he hit it. He didn't say much to the players. But one day when I was a junior, he said, look at this. He had just gotten a phone call from the president questioning him on why he needed new baseballs for this season. Why couldn't he use the ones from last year? And, and that's the type of situation that we were in. And <laughs> but, but on the other hand, but on the other hand, you get a great president, look what can happen, you know? And, and we, we've, had a, we've had a really good run because I, I just wanted to tell the group, and we were talking a little bit at supper, but uh, a name you should all know uh, is Jim Roshlow because when they hired Jim Roshlow, he was the one that saved this place. And whether people liked him or disliked him or whatever, um, he's the reason. If it wasn't for him, we probably wouldn't be here right now. And he was the one that started the off-campus centers. He was the one that thought outside the box. He wasn't afraid to make tough decisions. He wasn't afraid uh, to listen to anyone if he thought it would help the school. And, and because he started the centers, things started to turn around. And um, so when I, when I came back, we were starting what I felt like was an uptrend, okay? And, and, and when I took the job, um, I remember people calling me saying, you are an idiot. 
what are you doing? That You have no chance to win there, and you will never get another job. And they weren't doing it to be mean. They were doing it because they cared about me. Okay, and I remember Dick Glidden, who is at the Welcome House, Kent. Now, what is it? What would these guys know it as? Okay, the International House, that was Dick Glidden's house. It sat right where the rec center is. They moved it across the street. But he was, the, I think he was the superintendent of schools in North Fayette, or Fayette, it was actually still a Fayette High School when I was here. But, but anyway, Dick, Dick called me, he said, just hang in there and I'll get you a job at North Fayette. You don't want that job, Rick, because you'll never get, it'll ruin your career. You'll never get another job. And I knew in my heart, I knew in my heart. I didn't know about football, basketball, any of the other sports, but I knew in my heart that we could win in baseball if, if we had any kind of support whatsoever. And Mike McCready, Mike McCready had enough faith to give me that job as a young kid that didn't know anything. And we sit down at the field and he said, Rick, what do we need to do? And I told him a few things and I told him our field was arguably the worst field in America. I'm not talking the league, but in America. I mean, it didn't have a fence down the sides. The dugouts were falling down. People would walk by the dugout during the games. It had a snow fence in the outfield, it had chicken wire backstop. It was pathetic. When you looked out the shortstop, you saw about his knees. That's how bowed out it was. And there hadn't been anything done in 30 years. And, and I just told Mike, I said, we got to put a warning track in. we got to fix the infield a little bit. we got to put a chain link fence at the very least up. And he said, that's it? And I said, yeah. I said, that'll give me a start. I can recruit a little bit. He said, well, hey, we can do that. And I said, all right. <laughs> so, and when we shook hands, um, it's not about money either. That's the other thing. It was never about money. I mean, obviously, we all like money. But it was always about the game. And for me, I wanted to coach baseball at the highest level I possibly could because I love the game that much. So I brought this to show you it wasn't about money. Here's my first contract, okay? $14,500, all right? And I was making 22 as a high school coach, and I had to be the residence hall director. And my wife no longer had a job because she's now going to school. So there's times in your life when you have to take risk and a calculated risk. And that was one that a lot of people thought was a stupid decision and one that was the best decision that I ever made in my life. And, and, I, and I had to go against what pretty, I, I didn't have one person tell me I should take that job. And I just knew in my gut it was the right thing to do. And so for me to go that far backwards to roll the dice that we could turn that program around. And at that time, guys, we, we hadn't had a winning season in any sport in 18 years, I believe it was. And um, so with that being said, um, I want to say a, a few things about um, Louise and Cabby because now I start my new job, which is really 75% of the job at the time, and it was a big undertaking. And, and, and both Louise and Cabby, um, they took me under their wing. They taught me how to be a manager. They taught me how to be a leader. They taught me how to be a professional. They taught me how to dress the right way. They helped me with pretty much everything that I needed to know with the job. And, it, and, and as Louise can, can say, it was a tough time to be the residence hall director at Upper Iowa. I don't know if, if you guys know this story or not, but there was a guy that they hired. When he came, he put an ad this big in the Chicago Trib. Anybody that wants to play football, be at the bus station at 10 a.m. And he loaded up all of the, all the roughnecks. And for about, eh, we had 120 or 130 criminals basically running around campus, guns in the dorms. It was, it, was, it, all, it was bad. It was, I can't even begin to tell you how bad it was. Now, most of them were gone within a month, okay? But there was a few that, that st stayed around, and I came in at the back end of that, and there was a lot of cleaning up in the residence hall to do. I, don't, I mean, it was like being a cop some days in, a, in, a, in the inner city. And then, to make matters worse, um, all of us went through a really, really tough time with some bad luck, and, and this goes to show you. I mean, I was, I was as close to quitting anything in my life as I was after year two, we had a suicide, and it just happened to be a baseball player that I recruited from my hometown. Okay? We had a kid have a seizure and choke on his tongue when he was in his room alone. We had a kid that his buddies let him go out of the dorm at when he was drunk, and he hit a tree literally right down the block, hit the tree and died. And then a player that I had coached at Bakersfield in the basketball team was running down the floor and had a heart attack and dropped dead right on the floor. And that was all within a year. And that, that about did me in. And um, I went to Coach McCready and I said, Mike, I said, here's the deal, I can't do this anymore. If you can't get me out of the, the residence hall, I'm out. And so he got me involved with football and I coached receivers and helped coach football and baseball for the next 10 years while I was here. Um, but with that being said, um, you know, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good decision to come back to Fayette. 
and sometimes you have to take risks and um, I guess when I was talking about the professors and I'll backtrack I just said people will help you through tough times if you do the right thing every day and and you treat people with respect because that was the only thing those guys had to go on with me was they knew me as a student they knew me as an athlete they knew how I took care of my family and so that got me in the door I know it did with Louise and I know it did with Cabby and then when they interviewed me you know they gave me the shot and if they hadn't okayed that I wouldn't be here today without question so um, that first team, and this this will this will be a good message because it really wasn't a whole lot different than the message I just gave to the University of Iowa team last year. Well, when when I came back, number one, it was a really tough situation because I'd played with most of the guys and I was their same age, and so trying to separate player coach at my age was not an easy thing to do, especially when I lived in the dorm, same place they lived in. It wasn't. It was a really really tough tough situation. But the thing that I challenged them with was I said at this point in time in Upper Iowa, we just need something to cheer for. We have nothing right now. We have nothing to cheer for. We are going to be the team that people cheer for. We are going to change the culture. All right. We're not going to win games this year because we weren't very good, but we're going, to, we're going to redo the field. We're going to make the field nice. You guys, when we win our first championship, it's going to be because of the hard work that you guys do, the work on the field, the culture you're going to change off the field in the classroom. And they bought in and, and they bought in and we pulled together. And I, I, I mean, the warning track, when you go out to the baseball field, we did that with hand with hand uh, sod cutters. Each guy would take a, a spin around it. And w as soon as we got a cut, I went down to Willie Langerman and Willie let me use a skid loader and loaded it into the, uh, his dump truck. And then I went to Bernard Patterson and Bernard donated, um, he donated weed killers so we didn't have dandelions and he donated, he donated the uh, ag lime on the infield at the time. We cut the edges ourselves. We used the sod from the warning track. We leveled it out. Mike put the fence in and then we were off and running. And, and you know, as fate would have it, um, took over a team that won four games the year before. We were seven and 30 the first year. And on the spring trip, we had two good players. We had a shortstop was named Chris Babcock and he was a basketball player too, really good basketball player. Chris broke his ankle in the first game of the season. And our, and our absolute best player was a guy named Brent Bloomhagen from Bloomfield Davis County. And Brent was a left-hand pitcher center fielder and he dove for a ball in the last game of the spring trip and he broke his collarbone in two places and went out for the year. So within eight games, our two best players were gone on a team that started with 14 players. And those guys fought. We, we never worried about winning. We worried about winning every day. We worried about winning and how we take care of our business. And we worried about the, the, the process and, and not the results. And um, then the next year we, we had a good recruiting class. Uh, we were close. We had I think we had 13 one-run losses, didn't have the winning season. And then in 1990, um, we had our first winning season. Dank came on board, and um, that was the missing cog for what we were trying to do. Because up to that time, I was kind of a one-man show. Um, Gary Rima would roll over <laughs> every once in a while, uh, you know, the sports guy. Gary would roll over and help me whenever he could out of the kindness of his heart and uh, would show up and help at some games. Uh, but Dank was the first full-time assistant that, that we had. And uh, having him here and his passion for baseball and his story is just as good because of this, how he got here is a pretty amazing story to boot. But, but anyway, Mark uh, and I were a great match and a great team. And um, you know, we, we were able to, to work together and build what I think was an amazing program. 1990 was like, I always can compare it to Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile because as soon as we had that winning season in year 20, 20 years without a team, a team that had a winning season. When we did it, guess what happened? Football started to get better. Basketball had a winning season. Other people started to follow suit. In 93, we won our first championship and then there were more championships. And then 96, you know, we get to the World Series, we win the regional and football had their first winning season somewhere in there, 95 since 64. And uh, what we had going back then was very special. And, and, and I, I give Mike McCready a ton of credit because Mike McCready was our athletic director and wrestling coach. He was one of the best wrestlers in the history of wrestling. If you look, there's a book called The History of Wrestling. He's got a full page picture in it, okay? He's a heavyweight, big, mean looking guy and very soft spoken. And you only went to Mike if you really needed something because he scared the hell out of all of us. And he was uh, as tough a guy as you would ever find. But Mike, um, Mike would sacrifice, and I know he did this many times, he would sacrifice his own sport to help baseball or to help basketball. And you just don't see many people do that. They were athletic directors. If they're an athletic director and they're the coach of a sport, head coach, that doesn't happen. And Mike saw the big picture. 
All right? The, the mistake that Upper Iowa had made for years was that they tried to put all their eggs into football. Okay? And Mike and I talked, and Mike said, that's the wrong plan at Upper Iowa. We need to win in all the sports that we can win in, and then football will follow suit. But when we take money away from everybody else to try and win in football, and then football doesn't win, we all suffer, and it about buried us. And so that was Mike's plan, and, and it worked. It wasn't like he was taking money from football, but he just didn't take other people's money and put it into football. And so consequently, we were that team. We were the first team that people had to cheer for, and, and it made a big difference, and it was something that I'm very proud of. Uh, you know, if, if it sounds boastful, well, maybe it is, because I really feel like that was a key moment in Upper Iowa history and us turning the corner and turning the corner in the athletic department was when we started to win because now people started to feel good about something and then all the other sports filed. Stu Ingham was an amazing basketball coach, Dave Martin, and then uh, Paul Rudolph, and he was our head football coach during that time that we won amazing offensive minds, now the offensive coordinator at, at University of North Dakota. And then um, you, know, you, can't, you have to give credit to Craig Johnson, and, and Craig didn't have a great run when he was the head coach here, but the players that Craig Johnson brought here in football when we were Division Three were unbelievable. I mean, he was bringing Division One level players to Upper Iowa during those days, and he had a big, big role in turning, turning things around. That takes me to never burn bridges, and you know, good things are probably going to happen to you. Um, that's where I was going to close. I mean, that's my story. That's my message. Um, it takes, you know, if you're going to be successful, it takes a lot of discipline and self-sacrifice and a lot of motivation on your own. And um, self-leadership, but you have to have a passion for what you do, and then uh, you'll never quit. But um, I'm a baseball guy, so I'm a win every day and control what you control and all those cliches, but that's how we go about our business. You know, we focus on the process, and above all, you know, be a good person and treat people that can't do anything for you, or can't help you with respect and dignity, and good things will happen to you, and that's what I've tried to do my whole life. And, and the thing I'll leave you with is, is remember those people um, Remember those people who struggled uh, during the 70s and the 80s and back in the day because there are a lot of people that left a lot of blood, sweat, and tears out there so you can have what you have today. And, uh, you know, it's always a part of what we do, every program I've been involved with, and Mark will attest to that. We talked about every time we put that uniform on, we put it on for all those guys that came before us and, and gave us what we have and uh, try to leave this place a better place when, when you leave. So that's all I got. Ha, ha, ha.